Hello Redor, welcome to the second installment of Walking with the Broken. This week we'll be looking at Jesus shepherding his disciples. Now, just a quick recap, last week we saw that Jesus was calling his disciples in a unique way and that he chose to call unqualified, unprofessional people to not only become his followers, but eventually they would be workers of the ministries themselves. And so through that, we saw that Jesus called them in grace to trust in him. Now, if you read through the Gospels, you would see that the disciples had a front row seat to see everything that Jesus was doing and everything that Jesus was teaching. And today in Luke 9, we're going to see how they themselves were now going to apply the things that they've learned in ministry themselves. And just a little bit of a spoiler alert, uh, they don't get it right. They actually mess up. But before we get to the passage uh, in Luke 9, and we'll be looking at the verses from 37 to 57, and I want to encourage you to go and read that in your missional communities and in your DNA groups to really get the scope of what they were doing. Um, before we get to that, the, the context of Luke 9 is really important to get the full effect of the text. And Luke is pretty intentional with how he was arranging his material. In the beginning of Luke 9, we see three affirmations of who Jesus is. The first is the feeding of the 5,000, which not only demonstrated the miraculous workings of Jesus, but it was also a fulfillment of an Old Testament prophecy that God was going to send his shepherd that was going to feed his flock and his people. And the second was when Jesus asked his disciples, who do you guys say that I am? And Peter confessed, you are the Christ. And that word Christ meant the prophesied savior of the world. And so the disciples knew and they understood that Jesus wasn't just another prophet. He was the promised savior of the world. This was a very unique role that Jesus is fulfilling. Uh, the only role in history um, that one could fulfill to be the Christ. And the third was the transfiguration, where the disciples had a front row seat to see the glory of God displayed in Jesus, knowing that Jesus himself is also God. And so you would think after these three affirmations, or, or, or maybe the question is, what would our expectation be of the disciples? They were right there. They could see they could literally taste the miracles that Jesus was doing with the bread and the fishes, uh, what would our expectation be of their ministries? Would it be just these powerful testimonies of who Jesus is, these guys never faltering, and yet we see that that just wasn't the case. And so let's jump in. Five instances where the disciples were encountering real-life situations. The first is, and from verse 37, is that a father brings his boy to Jesus that is possessed by an unclean spirit, and he beseeches Jesus to really help him. And the reason why he comes to Jesus is because the disciples themselves, because of their unbelief, was un unable to help the father. And the second is, Jesus was foretelling his death, and he was sharing knowledge with his disciples, but they were simply lacking understanding about what Jesus was talking. Then we see that the disciples were arguing amongst one another who was the greatest and who was the most important. And then we see that the disciples encountered someone that wasn't part of the 12, but he was driving out demons in the name of Jesus, the very thing that they could not do because of their lack of faith, and they were trying to stop him. And then lastly, we see that they were encountering a Samaritan village that didn't want to host them and that rejected them. And because of that rejection, the disciples asked Jesus, specifically uh, John and James, the sons of Zebedee, the sons of thunder, uh, go figure. And they, they told Jesus, should we pray and ask for fire to come down from heaven just to eradicate the city? It's just a, a ludicrous thing to say. And so five instances, one after another, where they just failed miserably in ministry. We see that they were um, full of pride and vanity as they were struggling to see who's the most important and they were trying to hinder those that weren't with them. We see that they were without faith when they couldn't heal the boy. We see that they lacked grace for the Samaritan village. And we see that they lacked knowledge and understanding when Jesus was sharing what he was there to come and do. 
And so they just fell hopelessly short in their ministries. Now, I wonder how we would react if we were Jesus. I probably, in my own mind, I would tell the disciples, you guys just don't measure up. It's better if you pack your bags and you go home. Uh, one of the disciples themselves thought this about themselves, that they just, they keep on missing it. They keep up coming up short. And I wonder, I think this is a thought that many Christians have today, maybe yourself, as you've been engaging with Christian life, there are some things that you keep on struggling with. And because of our struggle, because of our brokenness, because of the way that we keep on failing, we start questioning whether we really called for this ministry or not. And we maybe want to pack our bags and we want to go home. But what's interesting to notice is to see the role that Jesus plays in these situations. Um, firstly, Jesus doesn't tell them to go home, but Jesus also doesn't leave them where they are. In fact, Jesus steps into the situation and he helps them to grow through the situation. And so if you think about their lack of faith or the lack of grace, Jesus was rebuking them and he was trying for them to live and believe differently. When they were filled with vanity and pride, Jesus was reprimanding them and he was correcting their thinking to rather live for the glory of God. And when they lacked understanding, Jesus was full of patience. And all of this because Jesus understood their calling that the disciples were called by grace, meaning that it's not because they were perfect that they were useful for ministry, but God was going to mold them. And so even for us today, even though we experience salvation and we are forgiven of our sins and the way that God sees us as perfect and without sin, the rest of our lives still doesn't reflect this reality. And we need to grow into this truth so that we can reflect and bear fruit outwardly what is true of us inwardly. All of this to say is that we're going to mess up, and we're going to mess up a lot. Uh, the theological term for this is growing in sanctification. And Jesus knows this, and so that's why he created discipleship environments for us to grow. Jesus wasn't content for them to stay where they were. He wanted them to grow. And so the environment where all of this happened was within this group of disciples. Similarly then for us as well. Jesus expects us as his disciples not just to follow him, not just to accept our calling, but also to understand the process of discipleship, which is a process of growth. Jesus wants us to, one, live in proximity with one another so that we create these discipleship environments, but then also speak into one another's lives so that we can continue to grow. Now, this is a difficult process, both in allowing others so close to you so that they may witness your brokenness and then speak into that and allowing them to speak into that, but also for you then to live close to others so that you would have the difficult conversations and sometimes speak correcting, reproving, loving, rebuking conversations with others when they don't get it right. Now, in all of this, we might get despondent because it doesn't always feel like the growth process is happening at the speed that we want. Uh, but I want to encourage us with the words of Paul as he writes to the church in Philippi, and he encourages them about this very thing in Philippians 1, chapter or, Philippians chapter 1 verse 6, Paul says, and I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ. All of this to say is that even though it feels like we are failing, Jesus encourages us to fail forward. He is using our brokenness and the places where we fall short to not only heal us but to speak into the lives of the people around us and ultimately he will grow us into maturity in him christian not only are you called to be a disciple in full-time ministry but god will use your brokenness and your failings to grow you and the people around you speak into one another's lives mm -hmm.